I'd love to. I read with great consternation the fact that the University of Scranton is going to oppose the City of Scranton's parking tax. I, I will state that there's probably many directors that are on the board of directors of the University of Scranton. There are probably many people in management positions up there that do not have the history of the University of Scranton and that the University of Scranton would not have the footprint that it currently has if it were not for the city. The University of Scranton is located where it is because of a donation from the Scranton family with the Scranton estate and somewhere in the early 60s on Monroe Avenue they built a new classroom facility that was in the early 60s. That was pretty much the confines of the University of Scranton. You could not expand beyond that footprint because virtually all of the land to the east was a residential area. The, I don't know how it came about, but the University of Scranton is what it is today because of the actions that the City of Scranton and the Scranton Redevelopment Authority took. They adopted what was known as the University Plan, which is an area bounded by Moyer Court on the west, Webster Avenue on the east, Mulberry Street on the north, and Ridge Row on the south. Virtually all of that area was a, was a residential area. Many stately homes uh, were in that area. And it was adopted as a blighted area in order to conform to the urban redevelopment law so the properties could be condemned, acquired by the redevelopment authority, and conveyed to the University of Scranton. The plan was never challenged by any residents. And as a result, many properties were condemned. And that is how the University of Scranton gained its foothold in the hill section in the major residential high tax producing area of the city. Um, if it were not for that plan, the University of Scranton never would have been able to expand eastward, northward, or southward. In fact, in any direction. The, city really came to the rescue of the University of Scranton and in later years even vacated large portions of Linden Street in order to make a campus. I thought it very ironic that, and I, I looked at it after giving this some consideration, that the city of Scranton uh, created its own Trojan horse such as the Greeks did with the ancient city of Troy. And I'm sure everybody knows the story of the Trojan horse. Uh, this is, I think, very apropos, especially since the former dean of the Graduate Business School of the University of Scranton wrote a very influential book called Inside the Trojan Horse. It is currently out of publication. There are copies available at the University of Scranton Library and probably also the Scranton Public Library. Dr. Strickland was a, has his PhD in economics from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, taught economics at the University of Scranton and ultimately became the Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Scranton. Inside the Trojan Horse was a book that's very critical of authorities in Pennsylvania, especially since they become too powerful. They end up controlling or having much more influence over the municipalities that they're supposed to serve. They end up to be out on a frolic of their own, through a free will, a free spirit, and there's really no way to control them. Because he was so critical of the authorities, Gene Peters, Mayor, Gene, Mayor Eugene Peters appointed Dr. Strickland to both the boards of the Redevelopment Authority and the Scranton Housing Authority. I serve with great pride on both the Scranton Redevelopment Authority 
and the Scranton Housing Authority with Dr. Strickland. And what has happened now, and it's been echoed, I'll say week after week, month after month, almost year after year, that the city should do something in order to curtail the University of Scranton. What can be done is that right now, the University of Scranton is beyond its institutional district. It is spreading into the residential areas up in the hill section. They've acquired vast amounts of property. They have built a dormitory on Mulberry Street in an R1 zone. There's a small sliver of that that is a, C, a C1 zone. But most of it is constructed within an R2 zone. They had to go before the Scranton Zoning Board in order to get variances. One variance should never have been granted, and that's a use variance. Every variance they request should have been denied. They have established parking lots in residential zones for which they had to have had a variance. It is my recommendation to the council, since the Scranton Zoning Hearing Board is an independent agency, totally separate and distinct from the city of Scranton, that the city of Scranton has standing to oppose any variance is filed by anyone. I believe that from this day forward, due to the fact that the University of Scranton that has a budget which ended May 31st, 2011 of $227,883,304. That's on their charitable tax return. That was their gross, which is approximately three times the city's budget. They had expenses of $185,038,781, which means that they had a gross profit of $42,844,523. Now, I know I'll be, I'll be chastised for saying it's a profit. This is what they filed with their charitable uh, their 990, I think it's 999S tax return. It has to be determined. If they're going to take the city of Scranton to court, how much of that $42 million actually goes towards charitable purposes? And I think that the city should vigorously, and this is not my function, it's easy for me to say, but I think the city should vigorously challenge the filing that they are an ileomycinary institution. There's a lot of money in here that they can use to pay the cities, to pay the, help the city and pay a fair share to the city of Scranton as is set forth in the recovery plan. They should take a good look at this and everything that the city of Scranton has done for the University of Scranton over the last 50 years and take a look and do what Brown University did to the city of Providence, Rhode Island. They should kick in a couple of million dollars to the city because if it weren't for the city, they wouldn't have the institution they have. And as I said, it's a Trojan horse because now they're outside, they're gobbling up more and more property, taking it off the tax rolls, going in because they're outside the institutional district and having to get variances. It had been my recommendation to council that Mrs. Craig write a letter to the Scranton Zoning Hearing Board and that every time the University of Scranton files an application for a variance that the Zoning Hearing Board give the mayor and council notice of the fact that they have a variance. If the city does not file an objection to the granting of a variance anywhere to the north of Mulberry Street, to the east of Webster Avenue, to the south of Moyer Court, and I know they can't go any more than Ridge Avenue because I think the Lackawanna River is there. But anyway, that I will appear before the Zoning Board on behalf of Council 
and object to the granting of any variance. It's one way to stop the University of Scranton from gobbling up any more properties knowing that they will not receive variances, that they will not be able to get a variance to construct anything north of Mulberry Street or east of Webster Avenue. Uh, one of the speakers tonight gave me another idea. I really think that so we will be fair to all nonprofits. I think any time a nonprofit makes an application for a variance before the zoning hearing board, no matter who the nonprofit is, council should be notified. Yes. And we should object. I don't care if it's the medical school, Marywood, you know, a hospital. I don't care if it's a small nonprofit that wants to acquire a property, knock it down, and put a parking lot in in a residential zone. It should be denied. And that's the way that we're going to get control. And it's the only way that we can get control of this area of the city, in many areas of the city, back to where it should be. And I have nothing further. If anybody has any questions on council, I'd be glad to answer them. Mrs. Craig, if we can send that letter as soon as possible, please, to the zoning board, uh, that council wishes to be notified of the appearance of any nonprofit before the zoning board seeking a variance for expansion. And I'm sure members of council and our solicitor will be present and vigorously opposing any further expansions in this city, which has been financially raped by the loss of tax, tax paying properties. Madam President, one thing I didn't say is the, the fact that that dormitory on the northerly side of Mulberry Street legally never should have been built. The two residents that, that took exceptions were on solid ground mm -hmm. because that was a use variance. In accordance with the law, that use variance could not be granted. And the granting of all of these variances for parking lots in these residential districts do not meet the requirements of the law. And as such, if those two people that did take, I don't know why they withdrew their appeal, that's not my concern, but they did. If they continued with their appeal, I have no doubt in my mind that they would have won. Maybe that they were bought out. I, Jack, I have no idea. I've seen some properties over there that were just for 27000 and the university paid 550 two years later without any improvements. So, you know, when you have big money, I'm not saying that's what happened, but uh, we could all surmise. And there's never an issue in making those purchases. They're done regularly. And as you said, at um, quite increased prices. Um, and I've noticed as well that um, the university, for example, is moving farther and farther into the downtown. Well, the, the thing is, in, it's zoning. Lawyer Court is between Jefferson and Madison Avenue. It's behind the old Emanuel Baptist Church. Um, that's the end of the line for, a, for an institutional district. Now, as they start coming into town, you're into different areas of zoning where maybe some of the things that, that they're purchasing and doing, they can legally do because it's in the proper zone. What I'm saying is that even if they're in a commercial district and they want to do something there where they have to have a variance, we mm -hmm. should object. Yes. And we will. And that until they realize that they cannot expand. If they buy another house up there with the idea that they're going to knock it down and add to other vacant land and put up another dormitory, they have to have a use variance. And there's no way that they should, legally can get it. And we have to object. It's the way to keep the pressure, to keep them. We can't push them back in to inside the institutional district but we can keep that institutional district from further expanding into a residential zone. Now, 
while, uh, thank you. Just while we're on that subject, something touched my mind, and uh, <clears throat> we've written letters about this previously. Uh, the street signage on Mulberry Street. Since since the university is working on that corridor, is it their responsibility to replace the signage, or is it still the city's responsibility? Because there are no street signs from I believe Jefferson up to Webster or, or beyond, and we've had numerous. Uh, rear-end accidents for people looking for Quincy Avenue from out of town to go to Moses Taylor Hospital. We brought this, sh this issue up several times here and sent letters with no response. I was just wondering, can we send a letter? Uh, who would we find out who's responsible? Since, since those light poles and all are part of the project of the university, is the signage part of their, you know, their deal with this Mulberry Street? Something has to be done. I mean, it's, it's been without signs for a long mm -hmm. time. And I've had a lot of people come to me, and we've sent letters previously, and another situation where we don't get any response. But I don't know, you know, who we would send Who do I look like, the answer man? Pardon? What do I look like, the answer man? <laughs> 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 I, I mean, I have no idea what that Mulberry Street quarter, I mean, that, that was there with the uh, state money and... Well, with PennDOT and everything else, I, I have no idea on that, but um, maybe you write a letter to the city solicitor and ask them. Okay, because I know it's not a state road from Jefferson Avenue up, it's city. I, I would add one further comment, and it goes to what was stated before about BRTIs. Paul Kelly and I have had discussions. He's upset about it, just like I am, and that's why I'm coordinating my thoughts with him as to how to proceed. 